It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Laurent Gatto from the University of Cambridge. He's the Senior Research Associate at the Department of Biochemistry. And I shall also mention that Laurent is involved in a lot of you know, movements uh, aiming to increase the transparency in research. So, for example, he's a member of the OpenCon Cambridge community here in Cambridge. He's also one of the participants in our open research pilot with the Wellcome Trust. He's a Software Sustainability Institute Fellow and also a trainer in software and data carpentry. So let me introduce the role and your presentation is available online. Thank you. Um, um, good morning, thank you very much for, for coming. So I'll be talking about one specific aspect of peer review that is very close to my heart, and it's really promoting open science. Why the process of doing peer review, I think, my role is to promote better science by making science more open and more, more transparent. So uh, I am an active researcher. I, I work in computational biology, but I am by no means a highly regarded reference in terms of peer review. I have done you know, free peer review for journals, funding bodies, and so on. Uh, but I certainly don't consider myself senior authority in peer review, and I think that is very good thing, because I do not have any vested interests. I can say what I think out loud without any pressure. So this talk is probably going to be about publishers or journals guidelines or frameworks. Um, it's not going to be political, because peer review and open science can be political. It's just my honest opinion of what do I need to do to promote what you need to know, to know uh, not what I am a researcher in, is just I'm a guy that is good with computers, good with data, and good with data analysis. There is a link there. Uh, I didn't mention, but um, there is a link there where you can get access on the slide deck to quite, quite a couple of version of open science. Um, oh, here we go. So there is a link if you want to know about my background, but that's not really relevant. So I think my responsibility as a reviewer is to make sure that I accept sound and valid research and provide constructive comments. And how can I do that? It's by focusing firstly on the validity of this research by looking at the data, the software, and the methods. If these fail, I, my first opinion would be that the rest is probably useless. So I would like to start with a quick survey. Um, who here thinks that reviewing data software and methods is asking too much from reviewers? Possibly being too time consuming? Anyone thinks that this is asking too much? Yes? Uh, I see a couple of timid hands. Um, I would assume that many people think it is. Okay. The, the survey was not very conclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Some people think it might be a little bit too much. Well, I, one thing I hope that you'll get out of this is that actually it's not. Because the review can be very, very quick. Because if there is no data, no software, no methods, there won't be any, any review. So I can go back to, my, to the editor very, very quickly saying, I'm sorry, I can't accept this paper. I, I can't reject it. I can't even review it. Um, accessibility of these. Being able to understand, maybe even being able to reproduce, is, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely essential. So how much time should we invest? I think um, I want to do a reasonable effort in finding the data, finding the methods, understanding it as much as I can, and maybe running everything and reproducing. I need to do a reasonable effort. And this will depend on my skills. Given my, my background, I think I'm fairly competent in trying to run software, debug it, maybe uh, do a, a reasonable effort. That's something that I think is reasonable for me. And I'll try, depending on my avail availability, depending, depending on the topic it is, I'll try, sometimes very hard, to get to the very bottom of things. But there are other uh, topics, molecular biology, mass spectrometry, where you know, I don't have the skills. I can read the material and method. And to be honest, 
whether it's correct or not, I have no clue. I won't be able to say. And I think that's per perfectly fair, right? Science is multidisciplinary. It becomes very, very complex. It is not my role to say that everything is correct. That is completely unfair. That's why we need multiple reviewers. As far as I'm concerned, and I think that is something that is very important, data, availability of the data is something that everybody should be able to look at. And it should not be too time consuming. So here are a couple of tips. The first one is I would always look at data availability. Data, software, it is, if it is a software paper or if the conclusion of the paper rely on one specific essential piece of software that everything is based on that, is the software there? Is it available? Can, can I run it? Is there any metadata? Are the metas described? Is it possible or impossible to reproduce? So all these points can take from, I don't know, one to a couple of minutes to look at. In that respect, the review can be very, very quick. Now, hopefully it will come back. Um, and whenever I, I do this first step, I always try to be con uh, constructive. And this, the fact of being constructive also helps me to uh, kind of follow the path through my, through my review. So I would not say, oh, I can't find the data. What's this? Maybe I would say, well, I didn't find any data, and I looked here and there. Or I, I found some data, but only partial data. And the reason this is a problem is that I would like to try to do this and that, and I can't. Um, maybe I found a lot of data, but it doesn't make sense to me. I'll get back to that later. Again, why is that a problem? Because I would like to try to reproduce a figure. Or this data is perfectly interesting for me. So I would like to maybe include it in my research, but I can't. Try to do some type of data analysis. I tried to install your software, I, and it wasn't possible. I got an error. Now, because that's something I'm familiar with, I might even try to debug and say, "Oh, actually, you forgot to mention in your installation instruction if there are any you know, that you need to install this before." So I can even be helpful and make progress in my review. Hmm. Assuming I find the data, I always look on the numbers. Do they match? So, for example, if the experimental design, if they describe um, some analysis that have been done in two groups and each group has uh, triplicates, I expect to see six files or a multiple of six. Or if the data is included as a spreadsheet, I expect to see a spreadsheet with, with let's assume, a multiple of six columns. I will also look at the file names or the, these, the column names. Is there some convention in naming these. Because already there, if I find five files and I expect six samples, something is wrong. If the files or the columns are named uh, from one to six, that is not very helpful. How can I know which sample belongs to which group? Yeah. Uh, the next thing that I will uh, look at is metadata. Um, as I said, in an ideal world, we, want, we would like to be able to reproduce everything. And it doesn't matter whether it's as a reviewer or as a researcher. If I have some interest in a piece of research, I might be, able, I might be interested in reproducing it. So in that respect, it's not necessarily only for reviewers. But you know, I won't have, maybe I don't have time or it's not that, of, that, that, that close to my research. So I might not be able to reproduce it. But imagine I want, imagine I'm too busy now and in one month I want to reproduce it. Can I, you know, is all the information there for me or anybody else to be able to extract the relevant information, find all the files they need to really reproduce or to really understand this piece of data? And again, you would be surprised. It's very, very easy to spot inconsistencies where I expect to find 12 raw files and there are only 11. Or the data are present in multiple places, multiple repositories, and the numbers don't match up. It doesn't require that much time, but I think it's a first indication that there might be, well, maybe there is nothing wrong, maybe there is just an honest mistake, most of the time, that's it. But this will make it much more difficult for people to really dig into the site. And personally, I always write a review file, which is a plain text file where I explain what all the files mean. Maybe I have a funny naming convention for my files. 
that will not make sense for an outsider, and that, that's perfectly fine. But then I will explain what the naming convention is. And another tip is, what kind of data do I expect? What kind of formats do I expect? Now, this will be very dependent on, on, on the field. But as somebody who works in proteomics, I know very well what kind of files to expect. If, and if they are not there, there is not a directory or file ending with .raw, for example, or whatever the other uh, files are. I know that. That's not normal. They, they should be there. If there is a, a, a format that I don't know, do they give me some indication of how to look into the file, how to use the file? If there is no indication of that, it's just the same as not sharing the data at all. Again, if I have raw data and process data and a summary table, do the numbers match there? Do the file names match? If they don't, there is no way for me to try to dig into the data without way too much effort. If I don't see the link between these different files, there is no way for me to try to reproduce or even understand how these different files were generated. And, and, and the last important point is uh, licenses. If people share data, they, if people share software, they need also to provide some information as to what can I do with the files? Am I just allowed to look at them on my screen? Again, that is not very useful. So, it is something that, as a reviewer, it's very easy to do. I might just say, well, there is no license. Could you please clarify what the implications are for you sharing these data, sharing that software? And it's very, very easy for the authors to address this. You just clarify it. They, they put a license. So it's very easy for me to make this as a comment, and it's very easy for the authors to, to address it. Maybe there are other reasons why they don't do it, but then this is a discussion that we need to have. So I'll, I'll try a second survey. Do you still think this is asking too much? Uh, do you think that this is something that should be done more systematically? I'm not sure to what extent it's done systematically. As I said, this is my, my very own and personal view. Do you think many people do that as part of their activities? Couple of knots up down that's fine. Apparently not so. But the real question is you know, who applies this? Not when they do peer review, but when they prepare their data. Because in, in an ideal world, we will everybody would do that from the very onset. And then peer review could focus on other things. So somehow having to focus on this is a sign that maybe there is another issue in science that is how to prepare and how to share data. Um, as somebody that um, values software and data, I think one of the things I also look for is are data and software also compliant and proper? If that's something I want to look into, I also want it to be possible for the people that are producing the data and the software to get credit for their effort. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing it. If there is a paper, I would cite a paper. Sometimes there is a DOI that links to the specific output directly. Uh, it's possible to use that. And to be honest, even if there is nothing like that, I would certainly make an effort to come up, you know, as long as there is a name and a URL, it is possible to create a reference in my reference list for that. And if the publisher comes back, blah, 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 it's not, you know, according to the format, I will find a way to make it to that format. But, you know, I think it's very important. If you want to put emphasis on data and software, it's essential to also give credit on data and software. Now, another really important piece of information, if we want to look for data and software, is where am I supposed to find it? Or, even before that, where am I supposed to put it to share it? So, in order of preference, the very first place would be in subject-specific repositories. If I work in proteomics, it would be my favorite or the kind of main master commentary proteomics repository. Genomics, it would be another one. Um, sometimes these are not available. Then maybe general repositories, you know, the share or institutional repositories uh, are, can, 
can also be really useful. I never use them because as part of my field, there is a dedicated repository, and that's where they need to come. Um, other solutions that I don't really like are supplemental information in papers. In my opinion, that's really, really bad. And personal web pages. And the problem with that is that there is no guarantee that the personal web pages will be there in one year. And by the way, there is no guarantee that this, unfortunately, that the journal supplemental information will be there in one year too. But the point is that there is no perfect solution. And so sometimes the combination of the above are great. So I would put my raw data in my subject-specific repository, um, and maybe I would share some process data as part of the software that I write. And maybe I would also want to have a, a, a page on my web page, on my personal web page, that describes, you know, that is kind of very personalized, that gives kind of an interesting spin to the data I want to share. But what really matters is that the data or the outputs that we want to share follow the FAIR principles. So the data have to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And as a reviewer, this is what I want to see. As an author, this is what I, I am aiming for when I submit my data, when I submit my journal. And as I try to um, suggest in the tips before, is that the, these things are not too time-consuming. You know, nobody asks a reviewer to reproduce you know, a day-long worth of uh, analyses and, and computational time. Some really easy things to spot. Can I find access data? Can I use it? And can I reuse it? So um, to finish off, maybe, you know, what would be an ideal uh, review system? So here I'm, I'm, I'm um, making some comments based on uh, Chris Hartling's and discussion and presentation we had recently in Cambridge as part of the Open ConCam meeting. And one important thing that we need to realize in peer review is that there is a lot of bias. And here I'm, I'm just mentioning two. One is a sample, small sample uh, bias. There are not that many reviews out there. So if some reviewers have some maybe bad habits, this can percolate through the community. But on the other hand, you know, if we want to have positive, make a positive change, again, this might put a lot of burden on us, but no, th there is this bias. But more importantly, um, in terms of methods, there are statistically, so statistically relevant or positive results. There is a bias in favor of these positive results. So if you have the two papers, one with only positive results, and another one that is mixed with positive and negative results, the one that only has positive results will be seen more favorably. And this is actually a real problem, because do you really think if you have a complex question, or a complex study with many questions, what is more likely, that all the questions are positive, or that some are positive and some are negative? Honestly, it can't work every time. But research has shown that something that is only positive is kind of selected for. So the ideal way to do review would be to split it in two parts. So Chris suggested that the first review would be the introduction and methods. We look at that, and if the methods are sound, given an environment and a context of introduction, then we proceed with the results. Otherwise, the results will influence us when we look at the methods. My suggestion would be, along the same lines, is first I submit my data, my output to a repository where it gets checked by people that know what they are looking for, what they are looking at. You know, looking at data requires some skills. So it's not just about the number of columns, but you have time and skills to look at the data. Uh, the specialists, by the way, data scientists, by data curators. And they check the data for quality, annotation, metadata, maybe they repeat some figures. And again, generating some of these figures can be out of it. I'll get back to that in a second. And then, after that, I, res I submit my research paper. And then as the reviewer doesn't need to check for these things because the reviewer knows, here's the paper, it links to these data in these accepted repository. There is no need to do these relatively easy checks, but still, you know, it takes time. So this would be my ideal peer review. Separating the data and methods review and then the science or whatever. And, and this could lead to a lot of discussion, but a lot of this could be automated. 
submitting data, a lot can be automated. So validating metadata. Some of it can be automated, other things are very difficult to automate. Uh, automatic generation of quality control figures, this can be automated. And we could even think further, you know, re replicating, automating a whole analysis pipeline so that when I have a paper, I, I have some guarantees that everything can repro reproduce. Now, I never said that because I can reproduce it, it means it's correct and valid, okay? This is a different story. But if I can't even regenerate the fundamental figure of the paper, maybe there is a problem. So I would like to thank you for your attention. I would also uh, thank the people that, that gave uh, input to, to, to these thoughts about peer review. If you're interested in more open science, and open access, and open data, we have a uh, very active community here with the Open Chem Group. The Office of Scholarly Communication gives a lot of courses. A lot of the things that I've kind of mentioned very briefly, like you know, what kind of formats for your data, where to submit the, your data, they have specific long or short courses about this. So have a look at their web page. And feel free to use the slides, use the content, and share it as much as you want. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm very sympathetic uh, to the whole idea of uh, sharing data and so on. Um, I think the more structural problem in research is that it's really a bottom-up procedure, right? So we don't have any central data repository, at least not in my field, which is political science. So everybody, you know, starts collecting their own macro-level, country-level data, you know, and then there's no comparability and so on. And um, so how would you basically uh, start this process to get going, right? Some sort of centralization, because I think this is really key to making it all more efficient in a way, and, and more yeah. reproducible. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. So my field, in my field, there are already some standards. I, like, I don't like it, but it's not like it's but Now, on the other hand, if there is no such thing for you, there is a great opportunity for you as a early career researcher, or or even established research, researcher to have an impact on your field. You know, in, in, in some fields, doing meta analysis becomes really a big thing. You know, there is so much data out there that I, I need to have a data analysis to, a first stage of analysis to navigate these databases and find interesting data to reanalyze. So there is maybe a nice opportunity for you. And, and you know, following these FAIR principles gives some really good high-level indications, not, not down in the details, technical details, what would be required. So, so maybe there is a nice opportunity for you. But yes, I agree that to some extent it's easier for me to say, oh, you have to submit your data to that repository because there is that repository. But I want to make another point is that, you know, guidelines and standards, you know, standards are just as good as the next standard to come up. So in my field, we have multiple data formats. Um, so there is also a, another side of, on, on standards and guidelines is that there will always be people that won't like them and will want to change them. But yeah, maybe sometime you, you'll come up with a great solution for your field. Hello, uh, Neil Jeffries at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, actually. Um, I wanted to make really some observations so that your requirements about sort of good data hygiene in terms of submission like that are pretty much exactly the same as the requirements we have for long-term preservation of scientific data. Um, so if you're actually interested in your material surviving for any period of time, it also makes sense to adhere to these things. And again, you know, one of the things he mentioned is DOIs. If you're putting it in a data site DOI repository, data site does make some requirements about longevity and the metadata you provide with it. So there are a lot of reasons to actually do these things besides just making peer review easy. It's good data practice in a lot of cases, especially if you're interested in meeting, for example, EPSRC guidelines for long-term retention of data. There are a lot of reasons to do this. Absolutely, thank you for underlining that. And actually, I think that you know, there is the right thing to do, but you know, there, is, there are also selfish reasons to do things. And one selfish reason to submit my data in you know, respect repositories is that they will do a lot of work for me. Backups, 
I'm not going to ask, you know, who's sure that they have backed up all their data and blah, blah. But you know, five years from now, after publishing my, my paper, where is the data? Can I find it? Can I trust that it's still there, it's not corrupted? To be honest, it's not really my problem anymore if I know that have, I have archived, I have submitted all the data that, that was needed and was used for that research. So there are some really selfish reasons to do it. It's not just for doing the right thing. But yeah, th thank you for underlining that. I'm Mary Vickers, I work in material science, and and we're very fortunate in our area that crystallographic stuff was done like this 20, 30 years ago. So uh, um, you know, where there are these crystallographic information files that you can just you just get the file, you can see exactly how the data was collected, you can go back to everything, and they are my joy and delight. And I realise that in many areas it's much more difficult, but. A lot of international people came together over a long period of time to point out these rules, which make life so much easier for everybody else. Yeah, that's I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks again, Laurel. Thank you.